Massive turnout has been reported across the United States in these midterm elections seen as a litmus test for President Donald Trump. They are the first national elections since Trump captured the White House in 2016. With his hardline policies and constant attack on migrants, today the country is more divided than ever. At stake are all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 seats in the 100-member Senate. 36 governor's polls are also for grabs, along with seats in state legislatures across the country. Opinion polls favor Democrats to capture a majority in the House of Representatives, but they suggest Republicans are likely to retain their majority in the Senate. This election is going to switch the Senate and the House seats. So if we can get a Democratic um, turnout, then we can help overrule some of the things that Donald Trump says and does. With all the uh, issues that are happening across the country and the negative uh, energy coming out of Washington and this president, it's great to see someone like Beto who has great energy, great enthusiasm, positive, great message. Civil rights leader and representative John Lewis has cast his vote in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1965, he protested along with Martin Luther King for voting rights. When asked what Stacey Abrams' win as the first female black governor would mean for the state, here's what he had to say. It would mean everything to the state of Georgia and to the South, to this region, and to our nation. It would lift people, give people a greater sense of hope that we're laying down the burden of race, that we're moving toward the creation of what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community. Our correspondent in New York, Karina Cartagena, tells us more. Today is midterm elections. Democrats hope for House win, and Republicans look to hold the Senate, but nobody is quite sure. With heated campaigns concluding across the country, the results could provide a vision for the future of both parties. Few hours before midterms and without evidence, President Donald Trump won of voter fraud in these elections. In a tweet early Monday, Donald Trump said that law enforcement has been strongly notified to watch for illegal voting. In remarks to reporters on his way to a campaign rally in Cleveland, President Donald Trump also falsely claimed that border fraud is commonplace. Organizations consider it important to go out and vote. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. We thank Karina for that report. In the Caribbean, elections are also taking place in Grenada, as well as in Tiwan Rebuta are voting in referendums to decide if the Caribbean Court of Justice should be their final appeal court instead of the Colonial Area Privy Council. There has been a low voter turnout in Antigua and Barbuda so far. Some say they were not aware of the schedule of the voting. Experts have argued that the Privy Council is the last vestige of colonialism in the region and as such should be removed. The vote holds significant meaning as it has the potential to change the way in which Caribbean people actively engage in regional integration and self-determination. The CCJ was established in 2003. To date, only Dominica, Guyana, Belize and Barbados have adopted the Trinidad-based court as their final court of appeal. Our correspondent in Port of Spain, Kijan Hayes, has more on the background. By Wednesday, the seven CCJ judges may have a lot more work on their hands. If Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada sign on to the CCJ, they join Barbados, Belize, Dominica and Guyana as countries in the CCJ's jurisdiction as final appellate court. For many, having Caribbean judges serving as the ultimate arbiters is the final step toward true independence and full regional integration. Adopting the CCJ would replace the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council based in London, an obscure court which many feel is too far removed from the Caribbean and Caribbean issues and too reminiscent of the colonial past. Switching to the CCJ is also less costly and matters can be heard faster than the Privy Council. Everything is all set for the court to become as accepted as, for example, the University of the West Indies, or the Caribbean Development Bank, or the Caribbean Examinations Council. All Caribbean institutions run by Caribbean nationals 
working to promote the ethos and goals of a proud Caribbean people. But it's that distance, literal and figurative, that keeps many in the Caribbean from adopting the regional appellate court. Many people don't trust Caribbean judges, fearing they can be easily corrupted, despite countless measures to ensure that they aren't. Also, there have been no accusations of corruption in the court's 18-year history. I already know one of them I do anything wrong. The mother got to write quite the queen. So let me remain there still. I acknowledge of the queen, of the, of the, um, CC, of the, queen um, the previous council. But we are ready for the CCJ yet. I know of it, I know the CCJ and what it means mm -hmm. to us as a, as, a, as a people. But if we decide to go off away from the, the queen, we have to go off from the, 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 the queen and off from Babylon entirely. It's been a long road to get here. The first proposal for a Caribbean Court of Appeal was tabled back in 1970. It wasn't until 2001 the first agreement to establish the Caribbean Court was signed by 10 states. Two more countries signed on a few years later, bringing the number to 12. Since 2005, the CCJ has been housed in this building in Port of Spain. Now, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has made no real steps to implement the CCJ as their final court of appeal. In one debate many years ago, the opposition said that there must be a referendum before that can happen. But there are only two countries which absolutely must have a referendum to implement the CCJ. That's Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada. We are now joined live by Gemma Handy, our correspondent in St. John's in Antigua and Barbuda, to discuss how voting has gone so far in today's referendum. Hello Gemma, how has it been today? Long lines in polling stations or have people been staying away? Well, as, as you pointed out earlier, it, it has been a little bit quieter, I think, perhaps than people were expecting. I've been to maybe six or seven polling stations across the island uh, throughout the day. All of them were a lot quieter than I was expecting them to be. Uh, I mean, there does seem to be a little bit of voter apathy. It certainly hasn't generated as much interest or as much talk on the street as you, as you might expect uh, for something that's such a, I would say, such a big thing for the country. Can you tell us how significant is this referendum for the country? Uh, well, it's interesting. For, for many people, this, is, this really goes to the core of breaking those age-old colonial ties. I think for, for many people, it's a sense of regional pride. You know, lots of countries broke uh, away from independence decades ago. Antigua and Barbuda has been independent since 1981. At the same time, in small island nations, you know, uh, family ties, political divisions can run deep. So there is uh, a sentiment of um, perhaps a little concern about it as well and whether people can properly trust the judges. Now, what have been people telling you? Do you think that people will choose the CCJ as their final court of appeal? Uh, well, it's going to be interesting to find out. I think we're going to get the, the result fairly early, perhaps uh, earlier than normally with elections. Uh, a lot of people have said it, it's very important that we now break these ties with Britain. Other people are concerned about the fact there's been a very uh, a partisan approach to campaigning. The opposition have been telling people to vote to retain the Privy Council, whereas the government have been, have been campaigning very strongly to tell people to, uh, to adopt the CCJ. And I think because both parties have adopted um, a certain stance, it's almost made people a little bit more suspicious perhaps and today this really has become as much about politics as anything else. Gemma, we thank you for your report. We have been speaking with Gemma Handy, she's our correspondent in St. John's in Antigua and Barbuda. We'll take a short break now, join us in a few. Welcome back. Over 4,500 Central American migrants have arrived to Mexico City since Sunday. The city's government has set up a temporary shelter at a sports stadium where they have received food, medical attention and clothes. The group is reportedly considering how long they'll stay in Mexico City before starting to once again walk towards the United States. The closest border crossing from their current location is nearly 800 kilometers away. We're heading to the U.S. Let's have faith in God that we are able to enter, even if Donald Trump says he won't let us in. Some of us have to get through. We all want the American dream. The caravan left the city of Cordoba in the state of Veracruz towards Mexico City. The migrants started walking at 5 a.m. just like the caravan assembly agreed on. 
vayan solos. Váyanse en grupo, señores, en los buses para que no les vaya a pasar nada en el camino. The migrants walk to a highway that crosses three states and that heads to the capital. Some boarded some vehicles to move faster. I am a little tired, but every day we move closer is a day we have to thank God for. Others walk to avoid the cramped trucks. The caravan traveled 230 kilometers to reach its next destination. Near the toll collection booths, the federal police helped some migrants hop on some cars. Once in Mexico City, they walk to a shelter in the municipality of Pizzacalco. We need water and baby supplies. Also, I would ask people to help with food and milk, especially for the younger ones. We have nothing to take care of babies. After 18 days, the migrant caravan has traveled for 1,180 kilometers on their way to the border with the United States. The presidents of Honduras and Guatemala have met in Honduras' capital, Tegucigalpa, to discuss the migrant caravans that have left Central America and are heading towards the United States. They say they are working in the creation of a plan to offer opportunities to citizens so they don't have to migrate. Both Juan Orlando Hernandez and Jimmy Morales say migrants have been deceived. They have also warned the caravans promoters will be held responsible. The organizers promised our countrymen that they'll receive money, food, transport during their entire trip, and they even encouraged them to participate in the caravan, claiming that they will receive humanitarian visas or shelter to enter the United States. We'll make an exhaustive investigation of who are the people responsible for creating, directing, organizing, and participating in the organization of these kind of caravans and this kind of migration. The president of Cuba, Miguel Díaz-Canel, is in China to strengthen business in commercial and technological areas. During his visit, he will sign agreements on trade, renewable energy, and in the cooperation of the Belt and Road Initiative, saying it's an opportunity for developing countries. China is the fourth stop on Díaz-Canel's first tour since he became president in April. Jair Bolsonaro has taken part during, his, during this Tuesday morning of his National Congress first act as the new president of Brazil. It has been also a special day for the 30 years enactment of the Brazilian federal constitution. Bolsonaro has banned entry to journalists. And after announcing the possible merger of the agricultural and environment ministries, President-elect Jair Bolsonaro has said that his government won't support giving land to indigenous people because that would put landlords at risk. I have said that if it's up to me, we will not have more demarcations of indigenous lands in Brazil because we have an indigenous area greater than the southeast region. The landlords cannot wake up and discover that through a decision of the executive they will lose their own property to a new indigenous land. Former President Lula da Silva has decided to try his luck with Brazil's Supreme Federal Court again. Lawyers of the former president and PT leader have filed a new habeas corpus appeal against what they believe to be his unlawful prison sentence. They did it after Bolsonaro named Judge Sergio Moro his new Minister of Justice and Public Security. Moro has been in charge of the car wash corruption investigation. Fran has given refugee status to former Chilean guerrilla member Ricardo Palma Salamanca, even after the Chilean government had asked for his extradition. Salamanca has been a fugitive for over 20 years after being sentenced for the murder of Senator Jaime Guzman. Friends and family members of Ricardo Palma Salamanca are celebrating. They say that political asylum his wife and children have received will end with two decades of persecution and will let them live in peace. They are grateful that French institutions have listened to them. France is a country where institutional powers are totally transparent and separate. In his meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron last October, Chilean President Sebastián Piñera asked for the extradition of the former guerrilla member. We talk about Palma Salamanca. What Chile wants is very simple. We want him back in Chile where he was judged and sentenced for terrorism. In April 1991, Ricardo Palma Salamanca, a former member of the Manuel Rodriguez Patriotic Front, killed Senator Jaime Guzmán, one of the collaborators in Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship. 
Few times people have had access to justice, real justice. Through Ricardo, we can have some dignity because who Ricardo killed, if Pinochet were Hitler, the men Ricardo killed would be Goebbels. Guzman was the brains behind the massacre of Chilean people. The dictatorship was a two-headed dragon, one civilian head, one military. I lost my parents. Who is to say that Jaime Guzman was not the one who planned my mother's murder? Palma was sentenced to life imprisonment, but in 1996 he escaped from a high security prison in a helicopter. Since then, authorities have been trying to bring him back to Chile. We strongly believe there were violations of due process and of human rights, including torture, during Ricardo Palma Salamanca's trial. Right wing and left wing parties are outraged by Palma's asylum. Many went to the French embassy in Santiago to leave a letter of complaint. We are asking the French government to revise the situation. We don't know all the French institutions. We understand the institution that approved his asylum has members designated by the French government. So we think it is evident that something can be done. Despite the fact the French government has made its decision, Chilean lawmakers still hope to see Palma Salamanca extradited. A new round of layoffs is threatening just under 200 workers at Argentina's Telearte Media Network, also known as Channel 9. The company says many positions made by redundant by technological advances, such as robotic cameras and remote units for live broadcasts. There was also a cut back in television programs, which resulted in more layoffs. President Mauricio Macri has said that economic adjustments made by his government has caused the unemployment rate to jump to 9.6%, the highest in 12 years. Argentina has released for the first time a birth certificate without gender identification. Local government says their registry office must create a new form, including online, in the place reserved to register gender. People will also be able to ask for an ID without gender specification. This gives me an internal peace, being able to reach legal statement on how I am and how I perceive myself. This is an achievement and a change in the world. If this can spread through the world and reach people that have never thought that can happen to them and can be legal in that way. The Peruvian Supreme Court is set to decide on the extradition of former judge Cesar Inostrosa from Spain. Inostrosa was arrested in Madrid after fleeing Peru, accused of leading a criminal organization that involved judges, lawyers and businessmen. If approved, the extradition request will be sent to the executive power. The former judge is also facing 36 months in preventive detention. And now let's go back to the midterm elections in the United States and with our correspondent in Washington, Jorge Gestoso. Hello, Jorge. How has the day gone so far and what is at stake in these elections? We are trying to reach Jorge at the moment. Let's see if we can reach him in a couple of seconds. No, let's go to a break now. Welcome back. Cameroonian President-elect Paul Biya has been sworn in for his seventh term. Biya won the presidential election on October with 71% of the vote. All the voters denounced alleged irregularities. His inauguration was held in the capital, Yaounde, under strong security. The 85-year-old has been in power for 36 years, becoming one of Africa's longest standing leaders. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa's address to Parliament had to be suspended for five minutes after two opposition members of Parliament exchanged punches on the floor of the Parliament. A physical fight broke out between Andreas Tulum of the Agang Party 
and economic freedom fighters MP Nasir Paulsen after Paulsen rose on a point of order when Tuluma was speaking. The two members were removed from the house after the scuffle. Can you please the protection services come in? South African president has dismissed insinuations that farm attacks in the country are racially motivated. Responding to a question from an opposition member of parliament, Ramaphosa said farm murders are happening across racial lines and not, not only affecting one racial groups as claimed by right-wing organizations. In a tweet in August, US, US President Donald Trump claimed that white farmers in South Africa were victims of racially motivated attacks. The fact that, yes, white farmers are being killed, including black people on farms are being killed as well, is the reality that we are living with. So the killings, the killings of a number of people in our country is something that concerns me. It should concern all of us. And I will never, I will never sort of categorize it as just saying white. It is people in our country are getting killed. Turkey's foreign minister says the man who flew to Turkey to kill Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi must have acted on orders. However, he insisted that the directions had not come from the Saudi prince Mohammed bin Salman. In a press conference in Tokyo, the minister also said that Saudi Arabia has the responsibility to tell its people what happened with Khashoggi's body. The Saudi journalist was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul early in October. And now let's take a look at what else is happening around the world. More than 200 mass graves containing up to 12,000 victims have been found so far in Iraq, according to the United Nations. They were found in regions controlled by the Islamic State group between 2014 and 2017. In August, UN investigators began collecting evidence for trials against IS militants in Iraqi courts and said these mass graves could contain critical forensic evidence. headquarters in Geneva and also in Istanbul have protested against China, demanding that it closes down detention camps that are set to hold one million Uyghurs and other Muslims. China has denied these camps are for political education, but referred to them as vocational training centers to boost economic growth and social mobility in the region. Today, and the more, we can say 99% Uyghur who live in, in exile have lost contact with family members. We have not access to we have not We have not get any information from the family members. Spanish authorities said at least 17 migrants have died over the last 24 hours while attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea from North Africa to Spain. Meanwhile, rescue operations have saved more than 100 migrants from makeshift rafts from the same area. The UN said more than 47,000 people made a dangerous journey to Spain from January to the end of October. Almost 600 deaths have been reported. Firefighters have found the body of the fourth victim in the ruins of two apartment blocks that collapsed in the French city of Marseille on Monday. Authorities said five to eight people may have been in the building when they collapsed. The bodies of two men and one woman have been pulled out so far. 120 police officers and 80 firefighters with sniffer dogs kept searching for ru the rubble for survivors. And now let's go back to the midterm elections in the United States with our correspondent in Washington, Jorge Gestoso. Hello, Jorge. How has the day gone so far and what is at stake in these elections? Well, the polls are registering a very large number of voters. Uh, here in the East Coast, uh, we are fighting also against the weather. It's, it's raining, stormy, but all over the country, the turnout so far is extremely high. Um, even before starting the day today, over 38 million voters have already voted. Early voters, 
or absentee voters, so that gives you a sense that it has been a number doubled of the one of uh, four years ago in the midterm elections of 2014. On the other hand, the New York Times is reporting that people have to be extremely careful with uh, meaning warning about false information, uh, fake news about uh, polling places or misleading uh, any way possible voters in order to avoid the, for them to vote. And w you were mentioning what is at stake. At stake, we have to be clearly follow key numbers. Key number, 23 seats. And we're talking 23 seats. It's what the Democrats need to gain control of the House of Representatives. Two, the number that the Democrats need to get control of the Senate. And there are 36 governmental elections also going on. One thing that is very important, the vote of women. Not only that over 270 women are participating as candidates in the process, but mostly women all along the country this time looks are much more interested to go to the polls and vote. And we have to be extremely careful to watch the votes of women living in the suburbs, well-educated white women that uh, in the 2016 election, they were voting for Donald Trump. And uh, according to different polls, now they could be changing their minds and voting for the Democrats. Uh, the polls depend on which part of the country that you are. It's a closing time. Some of them start at uh, six. Some of them start at 7, and in here in the area of Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, and the vicinity states of Virginia and Maryland, uh, polls close at 8. So we are following very closely what is going to be this that is considered, for example, by Vice, former Vice President uh, Joe Biden, the most important election in, on his life, at least, is being considered that is be the most important elections in a generation. And on the other hand, there is agreement that we are talking here about a referendum of the 22 months of presidency of Donald Trump. Jorge, we thank you so much for your insight and we'll get back to you throughout the day. And with Jorge Thank you for watching.